I'd like to meet this woman who's always saying that. Recording in progress. Anyway, do you see my slides? Mm, something is happening. One second. Wait, something is happening. Do I need to move my screen over? No, it's fantastic. We're good? All right, fantastic. Great. Well, thanks to everybody who uh, actually came down physically in person and flesh, which is kind of a, a new thing for us. I had a pretty long day, I have to say, at five o'clock today, because I was at a, a event in, in San Francisco, Bloomberg event, quite inspirational, where we listened to the uh, chief execs of uh, uh, Uber, Amazon, Experience, and the like. And uh, we actually uh, have really seen that connectivity plays a big role in their ecosystem, right? And uh, 5G now is on the way. People struggle to understand really the value of uh, 5G, but we as in a research community and you start thinking, how do you think about 6G? Now, you know, we, we could do a very technical session today, but, you know, being an information theory society, I think, you know, I wouldn't impress anybody. I thought I'd just give you a wider envelope, right? An industry view um, in terms of uh, where we are with 6G thinking, right? What's happening? How do we tick? Uh, how are cycles working? And give you a little bit of an envelope uh, in which direction we'd like you to go, right? So there's interesting stuff on terahertz sensing. You will hear that next week. And um, we have our opinion about this. So we're not quite sure this is a great idea, actually. And I'll come to this uh, in a moment. Uh, whilst it is a very interesting research challenge, presumably, um, joint sensing. Now I thought I'll share you a little bit the other ideas today uh, to get you essentially maybe inspired in terms of how to use the, um, um, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to kind of guide your, your um, research roadmaps. Before I forget, you had mentioned a few papers on 6G. So in the very early days, about uh, two, three years ago, there were four papers published. I think two, two of them by Ted Rappaport, um, and the other two were co-authored by myself. So these two papers are actually still out there, and the, the six challenges, everybody now talks about six challenges, okay? In 7G, we'll be talking about seven challenges. So in both papers, we talked about six challenges which need to be addressed. They range from hardware to algorithms to architecture uh, and all that. I think they're as timely as they were two or three years back. So uh, our stance has not changed. They're significantly more technical from an envelope as I'll present today. So you're most welcome to look to look them up. So these were the early papers there. Right, so to put things in context, I thought I'll give you uh, five important trends in telecoms, right? And they're quite important because they allow us really to understand what's going on. In fact, uh, they allow us to tell with a high fidelity uh, to say how 6G will look like. In fact, well, I'm able to say how 7G will look like, or 8G if it's still going to be around. And uh, this is because of trend number one here, um, and trend, uh, trend number two and three, you'll see in a moment. But number one is really, you know, that what I call the growth trend. Okay, so we, we kind of realized that over generations, something always improves by an order of magnitude. Okay, we try to, we try to get the data rate improved by even more, but in reality, peak data rate, the average experience data rate, the latency, the reliability always goes up by, by, by a factor of 10, all comes down by a factor of 10, okay? It's always happening very consistently. So therefore, you know, we know how 4G looks like, we know how 5G looks like, and therefore by virtue of interpolation, we know how 6G will look like, and after by virtue of interpolation, we know how 7G will look like, okay? So we know what it will be able to achieve Okay, we know that. Well, I'll show you the, the figures later. The average data rate on a good day on 5G, in theory, depending on which operator you're on here in the United States, should be about 100 megabits per second. That's the average, okay? Meaning in 6G, it will be a gig. In 7G, if we ever get there, it's going to be 10 gig. Why we need it? No idea. How we do it? No clue. But we know it. We will. We will be getting there. And I. I bet that in 6G we will have that one gig average data rate. So. The, so remember that the growth trend logarithmically is really happening. The other one is the consolidation trend, right? So we have seen that. That uh, some people call also the curse of the odd generation. We introduce a great idea in the odd generation, and it always takes us the even generation to sort it out. Okay, it's not strictly true, but if you look at it. Uh, from a high level point of view, we thought in 1G, you know, voice would be a good idea. And it wasn't until 2G that we got it right. 
in 3G, we said, hey, the internet would be a great idea to have it on the mobile broadband device. And it, it took us until 4G to make that happen. And then in, in 5G, we said, you know, let's do immersion, let's do XR, the metaverse. Everybody talks about this here in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get it, but these will be the baby steps like we had in, in, in 3G and in 1G. Uh, we'll probably really need 6G capabilities to get that full immersion going, right? So that consolidation trend is quite important. And a lot of times it's actually, really interestingly, it is the industry which is driving this. So, you know, in 1G, it was a B2B proposition. You know, the very early mobile phones, it wasn't a mobile, it wasn't a consumer product. It was an industry product, okay? Um, 3G, uh, the uh, Blackberries was an industry proposition, right? It then moved to the consumer space as the iPhone came out. Uh, 5G, probably, you know, a lot of the AR, XR stuff we're discussing now is going to be an industry proposition. We're talking about upskilling, reskilling. You know, Microsoft talks about HoloLens. How can we use that within factories and all that? And that will move into the consumer market. And, and that's quite important because whatever you see the industry picking up, will be a consumer product. So if you ever you're going to be a, you know in the position of a startup or you're advising startups, pay attention to that trend. It really tells you how the industry will play out, right? So we have seen that very consistently. If a trend happens two or three times, you know this is a bit like Moore's law. You can't really control it. It just happens, okay? So trend number three is that trend I call the trend of atomization. And we actually wrote a paper on this in uh, with uh, Rob, um, uh, Rob Heath and uh, Ronaldo and likes in 2000, I can't remember, 2010 maybe. Um, we called it, is the physical layer dead? Okay, so is the physical layer dead? That's how we called it. You should read it, it's still very timely. So it's based on Cooper's law, who uh, Martin Cooper, you know, the uh, alleged inventor of the mobile phone. He said, you know, wireless capacity over the last decades has roughly multiplied by a factor of a million. Okay, roughly. So... And then we started to look into this, you know, what really were the constituents of that? All right, the constituents. Turns out there is some noise there, factor five. There's um, loads of different contributions. Um, we do have a physical layer, factor five, which will happen here. Uh, we have a spectrum, factor 25, and we have smaller cells, a factor of uh, 1,600. In theory, if you multiply it all, it should be roughly a million. Maybe you can do that exercise for me. I haven't done it. But it's roughly that, that proportion. Now, why is that important? It means, you know, the, the bulk of capacity is really... Yeah, something is frozen. Can't hear. Two is, uh, isn't it time to do standards around AI? Right, so to do standards around AI uh, is something the ecosystem hasn't much thought about, but standards has really gotten us to the point where today you can buy a mobile phone in, in Buenos Aires, um, an iPhone, um, you know, sold in the US, produced in China, uh, call your friend in Australia, who themselves got a, you know, the application maybe from Europe. So, and that works because we spend a good deal of time trying to align all these standards initiatives, make sure it all works, okay? And um, so therefore having a standard for AI is quite interesting because what we are not so fond of is uh, a lock-in of AI capabilities. Telecoms by nature is a federated system. It could potentially be the biggest AI system on planet Earth. The last thing we want is, is that we got a Google algorithm not being able to talk to an Apple algorithm, not able to talk to a Meta algorithm. It's not a good news for us, I think, as a community. Our consumers will suffer. So I think it's a good time to start thinking about this, right? So, and... Um, I can share some news later around this, but things are cooking there. So here we go. Qualification is a big thing. Um, 
you know, DevOps are getting better, and of course, the internet is, is evolving. But you know, the top box is kind of the stuff which is kind of really pertinent. Now, what's the fifth trend? It's the economic trend, and I'm not going to bother you too much, but uh, we are able to really do an estimate on terms of, you know, what's the value of uh, 5G, 6G? We did it in 4G. We got the numbers. Um, we CTA has done, it's just the United States, by the way, uh, done the numbers for 5G. And they'll also be able to, to actually figure out that, you know, every month, Delaying the 5G rollout is $12 billion loss in the economy. That is pretty significant, right? And you do the maths, you have this one here in 4G, you got the trends, factor six. So therefore, you know, this is going to be in the order of $100 billion uh, for 6G. So we need to get it right. So uh, let's not lose time there. It's a question of regulation, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the, the five trends which really um, tick really in the ecosystem. Now, let's go to the actual roadmap. So how does it work? How do we design these systems? It is a very long journey. And the, 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 gra the, the gravitational part is this line here. There are three big ecosystems coming together. Academia, the majority of you in the room, I presume, uh, industry, um, and the regulators. Now, it, it started, you know, six-year research started really in, in academia in Finland, so it was uh, Matti who started with that. It, it was probably maybe uh, knowing Ian Akilditz, he probably did some 6G in the 4G era, because now in the 6G era, he's doing 7G. Anyway, some of you may know Ian Akilditz, so he's always well ahead. So fundamental research has been done for quite a while. A lot of interesting stuff coming there, and a lot of stuff uh, opens doors and will not be used by the industry in the end. Um, but who knows? It's worth doing it, right? So, for instance, I co-invented that principle of uh, distributed MIMO, um, corporate comms, which for a long time didn't 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 yield anything in the industry. Uh, and finally, we got it as comp, as a, a coded multipoint transmission. Um, and now we're getting the cell-free distribution, distributed MIMO. So it's all coming. Sometimes it takes time, right? In my case, it would be 1998 until today. Well, you do the math, 25 years. So um, it takes time. That moves quickly into applied research. And there's a box here, which I really like, and I think universities do that too little, and that's co-creation, right? And I did that at King's College in London so well as we used this 5G momentum where we started with fundamental research, went into applied research, and then we went out and we started to have fun because we started to actually go into society hate and say, what would you use 5G for? So I worked you know, with uh, real doctors in hospitals. I worked with some of the biggest musicians in the industry, uh, you know, trying to explain to them how 5G works, and we've done a lot of pioneering work there. Uh, but coming back to this, so now in the 6G era, era we're starting to, to see that alliances start forming. In the United States, we got ATIS, which is forming, um, and they start to get together and start to think about use cases, all right? And uh, i just shown you the slide before, you know, we're not very good at this in general. Okay, we always say, hey, what's going to be the killer app? Uh, and we always have to wait for the next uh, iPhone to come along to make this happen. But they're, they're doing this. IPR is being generated, goes to standard, to trials development. And it takes, of course, so long. This is really annoying, but it takes long. It takes about 10 years for this to happen. Why is that? Because this, this part here is, uh, takes so long. Okay, standards. It makes sure that you can make the phone call, uh, but everybody has to agree. Okay, everybody has to agree. That's a problem. Um, just think about, I don't know, you know, with your friends, sometimes you're just uh, disputing about certain things and how long it takes to resolve things on a company of a few people. Now imagine an ecosystem with uh, thousands of companies, 10,000 of people, and that is the reason why it takes so long. Okay, now um, the government side would then consolidate the use cases, give the KPIs, and then start to look at spectrum. So that's the role, but it takes a really long time. And um, this slide here shows you a little bit where we are today. So right now we got in the United States a really great initiative called the, uh, the Artist Next Year Alliance. Uh, we do contribute quite a lot. I think academia as well. I do invite you to contribute. I think it's quite important. NSF Rings, we are, Ericsson's a very big supporter of NSF Rings. Uh, the next, uh, next G1, there's also the European one. There's a lot of stuff happening at the moment, but that's the timeline. So we're talking about, you know, first studies on 6G around 2025 and standardization will start you know, in a few years' time. So we have a bit of time still uh, to do some fundamental research here. Now, from a use case point of view, um, what do we look at, right? And it turns out they're all fairly similar. i just give you the, the, the spin from Ericsson. So we, we, think, we think human, all right? So what's gonna be the human eating soon? We think machines, okay? We think um, environment and sustainability. So that's really how we tick, okay? We are looking at, 
you know, what's going to be the next big thing for us as a human. And remember that consolidation graph? You know, we thought about 5G being the new kind of metaverse XR type of environment. Probably we need to wait until 6G. So uh, not surprisingly, you see, you know, images like these, a real person with a holographic projection. So that's going to be really cool. That's going to be up and running in 6G. Okay, and I'm very confident about this because we, we've done prototypes of that. I'll show you in a moment. Uh, machines is always a big topic. Um, really taken off big time uh, at the moment. Uh, still a bit fragmented, but going. Then this is about reprogramming the world and, of course, uh, sustainability, sustainability. Everybody understands. So the technologies we think we need to make this happen um, are these four ingredients here. So the blue box is a really tough box. Okay, it's limitless connectivity. And maybe that is my call to you, to the Information Theory Society, is to say, hey, you know, what can we really do here? What are the what are the fundamental trade-offs? But do not come to me with fundamental trade-offs of bits per second per hertz, uh, you know, that type of stuff. We need system trade-offs. We really need system trade-offs. That's what we need, okay? Which takes into account, you know, the spectrum availability, uh, takes into account, you know, um, maybe finite uh, code length, takes into account, you know, the size of the cells, a lot of different things, right? So really fundamental stuff, mobility, AI, uh, AI, where you'll say why AI unlimited? Well, just think about it. The, you know, the majority of the traffic we have today could probably be pre-buffered, okay? So you could cache it. So therefore, the ability to predict what you're going to watch next and cache it when there's a good signal and then have essentially the ability for you to get a great signal even you go in a deep fade, you know, that's something that should be taken into account. So suddenly, as part of your very fundamental Shannonian equations, you get your caching work. There's also fundamental stuff there. In fact, I worked in 2016-17 on some very fundamental caching work in terms of edge cloud, mid cloud, and central cloud. Combine that with uh, with this, we don't know. We actually don't know. Literally, it's an open book. We don't know. It's really weird because we've been doing these systems for what, 50 years, 60 years? So here you go. Um, trust picked topic. Um, explainable AI, trusted AI is a big, big thing which is currently taken off. It was pioneered at King's College in London by uh, Maria and Derek, um, colleagues of mine. So we worked a lot on this. I have not seen so much about trustworthy systems in the United States. Uh, so therefore, I do encourage you to work on this a little bit more. And we'll come to this in the end. Uh, cognitive, quite a big topic, all things AI, and then the flattened uh, fabric. So we need these ingredients, and the industry really ticks along these four boxes. Uh, but I, I really think you know that's, that's one which seems like the most obvious one, but hasn't been cracked at all. OK, hasn't been cracked at all, which is maybe why uh, when we try to make a phone call with 5G today, it's not yet at the level as we would love it to be, okay? Love it to be, because maybe we're putting too much effort in trying to figure out what's the bits per seconds per hertz, uh, rather than what's my perceived quality of experience. And we can do that with these very fundamental bounds, which we don't have, so therefore my call for help. Um, just want to give you an example, right? So we'll start to look at it. In fact, there's a report we published, which I've sh shown you before on the previous slide, a 6G report. Uh, we just give that a bit of meat. So we just explain, hey, what does it mean, right? So if you were to go in a holographic society, well, you need more rates, low latency, full immersion, security, trust, et cetera. So we try to uh, quantify this, and we build prototypes around this, okay? So Mobile World Congress this year in Barcelona, we had a, a very, very unlikely uh, success, and that was our uh, tool, which is called Holotaring. In fact, it was uh, quite exciting for everybody in the industry. So everybody, you know, the likes of Meta, Apple, and then all these, they came to our, our boat, actually, several times trying to understand how did we do that, okay? Um, I, I, I didn't get permission to show you the video, but the weird thing is if you register with Imagine Life Kickoff 2022, you can see it actually, okay? So this uh, is a great video and I've seen the devices, so it's real. So what happens is, you know, um, we got somebody with AR glasses here and uh, she's talking to a person who's been, has been captured in real time, okay? With a sensing device on, on, an, on another end of comms link and they see each other at extremely high fidelity. Right? And all that's done wisely over 5G uh, works really, really well. So this holographic capability is actually coming. And it was quite remarkable because, you know, it gave you much more of that sense of immersion, uh, really much more of that sense of being together, a bit like we are here together. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see each other. We have this um, emotional bond, you know, which you don't have on Teams or Zoom. You just don't have it. 
And here you get it. So therefore, we think this could be something really interesting. Um, we're not the only ones who thought about 6G. So there's artists. I really recommend you to look at the report. It just came out. It's for free. Just uh, register and download that. Um, again, same thinking, machines, people, environment, sustainability, exactly the same thing. NGMN traditionally has been very influential and in when it comes to uh, doing 6G or use cases for the Gs, uh, they've done that. The same exercise and came out with a, with a whole set of really interesting ones. Um, very rigorous in terms of looking what's really the difference between 5G and 6G. Right? So we had this discussion in the 4G to 5G era. I remember I spent a lot of time pushing back applications where, which could perfectly work in 4G. Okay, And uh, we really focused on the true 5G applications. And the same has to happen here. Now, what is it, what's happening then? So you got the use cases, right? So we said, okay, holographic communications, this and that. And what we need to do now is we need to translate this to engineering numbers so you guys can get going and we can get going and start building systems. OK, and prototype and see how can we make it happen. So if you look at the numbers, um, remember my my trend number one. OK, that something always improves by an order of magnitude. So these are my personal estimates. We might be a little bit on and off, but I'm quite sure we'll hit this. So you can see we got, you know, the average experience data rate is one gigabit per second. Latency on the user plane is 100 microseconds. OK, why do we need that? I'm not sure. Really, don't ask me. Right. I really don't know. Uh, as we didn't know in the 4G era, why do we need this data rate? Okay, on the 5G era, why do we? And then the iPhone came along, internet came first along, then the iPhone came along, now XR devices will come along hopefully, and suddenly all that makes sense. But the one thing I realized is if you look at the mobile data volume, so the density, okay, we're talking now in a 6G era of a density of 10 petabytes per second per square kilometer. Now, this is gigantic data rate. Who needs that? I don't know, right? So um, I think there will be a new user in 6G, which is really like fully autonomous AI and machines who will be using uh, that type of density to be confirmed. But you know, if you trust the maths, you trust the trends, that's where we're going to be, OK? You see all these numbers here, multiplied by 10, divided by 10. How to do it? No idea. Why we need it? No idea. But it's going to look like that. Right, so we got now the uh, KPIs, and uh, typically what happens is the ITU, uh, the International Telecom Union, would now start to get a good idea about, you know, what would a system like 6G look like in probably in a year's time, and you can follow their work here on this website, you just uh, search for that, in a year's time they will say any system, any system which has these type of KPIs will be a 6G system, all right? And um, we had it in 4G, really interesting story back then. You know, in 4G, ITU said, okay, any system which has these type of data rates, latency, et cetera, will be a 4G system. And, um, and then IEEE started working on this. WiMAX, you remember WiMAX days, WiMAX 1, WiMAX 2. Um, and uh, they submitted it. In fact, WiMAX 2, strictly speaking, is a 4G system. Of course, got never deployed. Okay, got never deployed. Uh, and 3GBP, another standards body, also started working and came up with a 4G system, which we are using now. Uh, in the 5G era, IEEE hasn't even tried. And I think the 6G, they won't uh, try either. But in theory, anybody could come up with the system and say, go to the ITU in, in, in 10 years' time and say, look, that's my design. Uh, if you're okay with that, you know, if, if, it, if it fulfills these parameters, it's going to be a 6G system. So maybe you can design a Stanford system, right? So, and submit it to the ITU and will be the 6G Stanford uh, system. It can be very creative with that. People normally don't know about this. I think it's, it's a big thing, but, uh, you know, in theory, you could do that. Of course, not that simple. But anyway, so uh, the biggest buddy and the most likely buddy to build as that 6G system is 3GBP. And it's you know, composed of loads of uh, vendors and operators around the world. Eric is a very strong constituent here. And 3GBP, interestingly, doesn't work in generations. Uh, you know, engineers don't like that marketing shebang. So as engineers, we don't think 5G, 6G, 4G. We think in smaller steps and releases, OK? So 5G was done in five releases, so release 15 until release 19. And release 19 isn't even done yet. It's 18, currently being designed, OK? Um, 
And just my personal projections, so these are no, by no way official for GBP or Ericsson or anybody else's numbers, uh, just using the trend from, two, uh, from 2G, 3G, sorry, yeah, 3G, 4G, 5G to 6G, I know that most likely we'll have our first standards around release 20 in the year 2025, okay? And that will open it most likely in 2023. Now, it is almost 2023, so therefore the window to uh, the, the meaningful window to contribute to the first 6G standard is actually getting very short. Okay, it's getting very short. It's, uh, you know, so clearly at the beginning, at least 20, we'll have a little bit, we'll still be majority 5G plus, uh, only release, uh, only probably releases 21, 22 is my personal guess will really be uh, full 6G standards. But I just want to say, you know, it is not that we have a lot of time. We as consumers will use 6G in 10 years' time, but uh, as industry, we need to get moving, okay? So anybody who's involved in that, we need to get moving. So here you go. And if you go to the 3GBP website, you can click on any release. So release 19 is still at the very end of the 5G um, track. In fact, it will be called 5G Advanced. And you click on the current uh, study items, and you see, hey, we're talking about, I'm not sure you can see, but we're talking about uh, joint sensing and communications. Hey, hello, this is a big topic, right? So we're talking about this from an academic point of view. And industry said, interesting, we want this. So we're going to look at it. Metaverse stuff, I haven't, I had seen it. Uh, native AI ML, uh, federated learning. So all the things we as an academic community are talking about, you know, will is actually being considered as a study item within 3 gpp So it is, it is of interest to industry and industry is catching up. Industry is listening to you. So um, how do we see? Well, we see like, you know, 5G, we have it right now. 5G was structured around three use cases. And I think our community is the worst community in coming up with uh, acronyms and abbreviations. We're really terrible. Um, somebody once told me they look a little bit like super secure passwords, you know, when I start talking about this. Anyway, if you've been in the industry, you know that this one up there stands for enhanced mobile broadband, meaning more video, okay? This one here means uh, ultra reliable, uh, low latency comms, meaning very low latency, very reliable, well, what the name says basically, okay? Um, and this one stands for massive machine type communication, which means a lot of sensors, loads of sensors, okay? So these are the three axes of 3GBP. Now, uh, in 5G Advanced, we will enhance that and push out the capabilities, right? So for instance, uh, massive machine type communications will go to massive machine type communications <laughs> plus, right? And the thing is called red cap, which is reduced capability. So we're just trying to build up on that. And then 6G will go into the expansion era, right? So we'll, we'll get better on all these three dimensions, but we'll introduce new stuff. We'll introduce a lot of the holographic capabilities, native AI, um, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we make this happen? We don't know, we need, we need the wider community to make this happen. But really immersion is there. Uh, spatial temporal is there and compute AI is there. Okay, so this is really interesting stuff because um, not sure any of you has been at the recent AWE conference, the uh, Augmented World Expo, which happened here. Um, it's like the Mobile World Congress of, let's say, XR devices, right? It's amazing. I mean, you know, what's happening there is it's really mind boggling. It's, uh, it's, it's both exciting as well as frightening. And you put that together with our networks and you look at what the applications are doing, uh, the world will be very different from 10 years from now, right? So, uh, you know. Anyway, let's move on to the challenges. Okay, so I've geared up a little bit and uh, I'm gonna start easy, easy and difficult. So challenge number one is, well, we need your help, okay? Uh, challenge number one is, is around this, um, you know, cyber physical continuum. So we'll see a world um, uh, um, uh, appearing over the next years, which will allow us essentially to create digital representations, but not only this, also reprogram these worlds, okay? Reprogram, and uh, I think this is really interesting because you know currently people only look at, in comms, the uplink or the downlink, okay? But not the uplink and downlink. They look at sensing, okay, or acting, but not sensing and actuation. And anybody who studied control knows that, you know, even just looking at stability criteria, like uh, the Yapunov criteria, you have a lot of conditions where things can go wrong, 
all right? So a perfectly stable system in a situation with a control feedback loop becomes a nightmare. Multiply this by a billion devices, multiply this by uh, augmented by critical services with humans in the loop, and you're gonna get in a scenario which is not gonna be pretty. So therefore we need to understand, we need a better understanding, uh, actually really a fundamental understanding, mm. how would that look like in a real system? Okay, how would my future look like? So I can think of a future where literally, you know, in, in 10 years time, you know, we're sensing that, you know, it's just, just 20 people in the room, but we have 50 chairs. So some of the chairs would actually start folding themselves and we just end up in a situation where we have a very cozy environment, right? So we start to reprogram literally our environment because robotics is becoming good, it's been miniaturized. Same trend as comms, it's happening. So the, the link between sensing, between actuation and a really reprogrammed world way, together with the uh, closed loop feedback things, we have no clue what the, how this will play out. No idea. Okay, so we need help there. We really need to know how to do this. So that's my challenge number one to you. Mm. Challenge number two uh, is about mm. a lot. Of, okay, uh, so mm. it uh, turns out that you know what we build in five G is an amazing low latency system, right? But it's a local area network. So the low latency of one millisecond or ten millisecond only works within the same manufacturing hall or within a very, very short distance. So what we did is that very first baby step, right? We designed a local area network, but we know that the internet is the internet because it has become an international network, not because it stayed the local area network. Some of us will remember the days in 1990, whatever, where we have been nailing ethernet cables into our rooms, right? So some of us do remember these days. Um, and we built the local area networks and a lot of things has happened. And the moment we built the internet, interconnecting all these, right? All the DARPAs around the world, all these networks, we connected up. This is where the internet really emerged. The rest is history. But with our low latency thing, we haven't achieved this yet. We're still at the, at the baby age, right? So you can do it uh, in a manufacturing hall. But then giving you the example here, you know, if you, want, if you want to connect something from London to LA, trying to do that within 10 milliseconds, forget about it, all right? I made it very simple for you to see the boxes, right? So you got, you got application delays. Nobody talks about this. It's really annoying. We build, we spend billions of dollars in the comms industry designing networks which give you a millisecond latency, and then the Zoom coding comes along and takes 67 milliseconds. What's the point, okay? So suddenly people will go, I've been, somebody who's followed my talks will know I've been talking about this for years. So we need a standardized low latency codex, which now is not only video and audio, it has to be volumetric. It has to be spatial. How do you do that? I don't know. Um, we need it for, for, for haptics, right? So I co-founded a standards group on haptic codex because I felt we need MP3s for, for touch, right? So, but this needs to be a low latency. We need to get, really make sure we get rid of these boxes. In fact, the green boxes would end on the wall there. Just cut it off because the slide isn't big enough. So therefore this needs to go down uh, to the minimum we can do. In the networks, we have done our magic. We have introduced slicing in 5G. We got at the radio access network, ultra reliable, um, uh, ultra reliable low latency comms. L4S, if you're into, into ITF type of stuff, you can do things now, magic is happening. But then we got something really annoying. It's called speed of light, okay? Uh, it turns out as little we can do in the classical physics, at least, in the uh, quantum physics, maybe, by means of uh, entanglement. But uh, in terms of the classic physics, um, you got these, in fact, London to LA is 36 milliseconds, okay, in fiber. Maybe you can do a hollow fiber, it goes down by 30%, uh, 30% but it's, you know, it's, it's this. So how do you deal with that? It seems to be a fundamental limit, but actually turns out that we looked a lot of using artificial intelligence of being able to predict almost in real time what's happening on the other end of the world. And that you can do that because our environment, as well as, as humans, we are quite predictable. Okay, it's not all super duper chaotic. And I'm not talking uh, about predicting what I'll be doing in the next 10 minutes. It's about predicting what I'll be doing in the next uh, 10 milliseconds, okay, or 30 milliseconds. And the whole field is called model-mediated teleoperation systems. Um, 
And it's a field which I think has not received enough attention. We need more of that, and that's really, we need models, we need theoretical support there. We really need to understand what's happening in terms of environment. How much can you truly predict, um, even from an information and entropy point of view, how far can you push the envelope, right? So if we get this right, we got there, we got this right, we got this one right, we'll take care of this, don't worry. Um, I'm pushing on this one here, and the ecosystem started to wake up on this, put all together, and maybe in 10 years' time, we're going to have a global ultra-low latency network. Okay, that would, be, that would be my dream, because then we can do a lot of things, because then I can suddenly move objects through the internet. Okay, um, turns out that touch, actually, you know, people call it the tactile internet, uh, which is a bit of a mistake, because tactile is derived from touch, and touch has almost no latency constraints at all we basically do barely feel it, okay? Specifically when you're in, in movement and motion, you don't feel touch, very little, which is why uh, pickpockets always steal your stuff when, when you're walking, all right? They know that. So touch is not the problem. The problem is the kinesthetic signal. So the haptic signal is composed of a tactile and of a kinesthetic signal. Uh, the tactile, no latency constraints whatsoever. I mean, within whatever, 100, 200 milliseconds, not a problem. Uh, the kinesthetic is the problem, meaning muscle movement, okay? If you move something, you want the action, reaction. You get very quickly back. I'll give you the example of surgery, okay? If somebody does a surgery across the world and the surgeon cuts for tissue, he or she would like to feed, get a feedback very quickly on what type of tissue that, that is. Because if, if it's the wrong signal, you know, you cut through an artery or vein, uh, it's not good news. So therefore, having the ability of action and reaction come back within a few milliseconds, hugely important, hugely important, and completely undervalued in the ecosystem. We, for some reason, uh, you know, got kind of hooked up with the whole touch thing and tactile thing, which was really kind of misleading the entire ecosystem. So focus on this, focus on the low uh, latency. We need new codex, standardized, nothing proprietary, please. In fact, in Stanford, you got somebody who pioneered the whole notion of low latency audio codex, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, who said, I forget, forgot. Anyway, so we worked with Chris quite a lot when we did the London thing, et cetera. So we need, we need a, the community come in there and a lot of theoretical support. Number three, and that comes to the talk you will be hearing next week on two weeks time. It's all around spectrum. Now, spectrum is exciting. Um, it's invisible, of course, for some reason, it's, it's attributed a lot of value. It has
Okay. Okay. We're good? All right. Really. All right. So basically what I'm seeing is, is, you know, whatever smart stuff you guys come up with, whether that is joint sensing and comms, whether this is high precision slam capabilities, localization and all that, whether this is, you know, property X, Y, Z, intelligent reflective surfaces, whether that is whatever you come up with, please make sure it works in these bands because otherwise, you know, we'll struggle to get this really commercial. Okay. So as I said before, interesting bands, but let's not use all the NSF money now on terahertz comms just because it's the sexiest term on the block when we know that in 10 years' time, this is what the operators want, this is what the consumers will want, this is what uh, we as an industry want. So therefore, if I have just this one wish list, right? So uh, by all means, explore, come up, be inspired, come up with new things, but translate them back here. Can you do joint sensing and comms at 10 gigahertz? Big question. I don't know. You tell me. Resolution. What can we do? We have a distributed system. Uh, you, you were thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a resolution thing, right? Because uh, the, uh, the sensing works on the, on the carrier frequency. So therefore, you know, the higher you go, the better the resolution. But the question is, can you get a decent resolution uh, down here as well at these bands? And I think you can, right? I think you can. And, uh, yeah, we just need to work a little bit differently. We need maybe to work with space. We have a spatial construct. Telecom is a spatial construct. But we just don't know what are the limits. What can we truly do from a bounds point of view? And we would love to leave that to you. And we do the rest of the magic. Okay, we do the rest of the magic. And the other thing, you know, because I'm sitting on the advisory board of... Um, the spectrum board of Ofcom, which is the regulator in the United Kingdom, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, how can we make most use out of the spectrum? And it turns out you can't see spectrum anymore separately from real estate, uh, you know, from fiber deployment and all that. It's not an information theory problem. But I'm just telling you that, you know, from a legislation point of view, we're thinking about this. I'm going to join the FCC soon as well, and we'll be discussing exactly these issues. So it's, it's hugely complex um, and, uh, you know, hugely complicated. And the last thing, really, maybe that wasn't a problem in the United States, but in the UK, you know, we had, uh, we had loads of people thinking that 5G is uh, killing birds, causing uh, COVID and all that. Uh, it was quite a movement, you know. I'm not sure where this came from, but... Um, I maintain, you know, that uh, we need to, as engineers, I think we have the, we have actually the responsibility of educating our consumer well. We should do this. And I've urged Ofcom, um, and I'll be urging the FCC as well, to make sure that we educate consumers early enough about, you know, all, all the work we do to guarantee safety, Okay. Uh, to make sure that the radiation doesn't cause any ionization, radiation doesn't cause any cancer, radiation doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't kill birds or cause COVID or whatever it's, uh, it's going to be there in 2030. So therefore, you know, it is a larger ticket. Spectrum is really complicated. There's a loads of emotions attached to this, whether this is the uh, NSF money here, okay, whether that is um, the real estate problem here. Uh, or whether that is really the uh, the conspiracy theories we have had there, you know. So we need to get this right in the sixth year. Um, but uh, at least the red box, I'll leave that for you as a problem. Uh, my challenge number four is to really think bigger in terms of what can we do with AI, okay? So we've used AI to do, you know, automated networks. Uh, those have been long, long, long around enough now that we've been automating, you know, telco systems for quite a while. Then in release eight, as of 2008, we introduced that concept of SON, self-organizing network. Right, so um, that was great. So self-organizing networking is really all about using AI to configure the network which has been designed by humans, okay? It's uh, engineers like you and me who built the system, threw out loads of parameters. At some point, we didn't anymore how to optimize things, and we gave it to the machines to do it. And they do it pretty well now, okay? Loads of problems there, but we can do it today. Now, what's beyond? What can we do beyond, right? So I got this inspiration from... Um, you know, what's happening with GitHub. I'm not sure how much you follow that, but uh, yeah, GitHub was acquired by Microsoft recently for quite a lot of money, and everybody was wondering why, but I've seen the game plan straight ahead. So what Microsoft wanted to do is it wanted to learn how people program, okay, how people program. And now they have on GitHub something called the AI co-designer, okay, which is helping the programmers to write better code. 30%, 30% no, more than 30%, of all the code committed back onto GitHub is now written by AI, all right? You do the extrapolation, 
by 2028, we won't need computer scientists anymore. Sorry, we won't need uh, programmers anymore. We may still need computer scientists, but not programmers. So I thought, hey, sh shouldn't we do the same in telecoms? What about, what about trying to see how can we shorten these design cycles, right, which take us currently 10 years because we argue in the 3GBP meetings on what to do. Uh, why will we leave that to the machines and see how we can do this, right? So, um, so this notion of, uh, I introduced it actually, you know, this is a personal notion. It's not an Ericsson notion per se. Um, this notion of self-synthesizing networks. So there's a whole Etsy article on this um, a while back in autumn last year. The notion of using AI really creating these future networks, coming up with stuff which we humans haven't thought about. NVIDIA does it, right? So I listened to the CEO of uh, NVIDIA the other day. He said, look, we, uh, we use AI to design GPUs. And it comes up with stuff which the human engineers say it's impossible. Yeah, it never works. Turns out they run it, and it's actually better than what any human came up with. Okay, so we'll, we may need to go through that same process here. And I gave it a name: self synthesized networks, because these are networks which build themselves. Okay, and we start seeing this a little bit in the. Um, if you're in this space, I'm not sure the the, the full composition of the audience, but uh, you know, if you if you use AI today to uh, on the receiver side. To estimate essentially the noise space, you know, the AI is basically being used on the uh, to to optimize signal to noise interference ratios and all that. Uh, these are the first steps, but I want to go beyond. I want to have entire systems designed with AI. Challenge, leave it for you to do. Okay, if you can come up with good solutions, how to do it? Uh, once you've done it, we want answers on how to do standards in the future. How is the standard meeting going to look like? Is it like AI machine against the other AI machine? How patterns going to look like, right? So it has a repercussion on the entire ecosystem, but loads of open questions there. But the future is happening. So I'm not dreaming this up. Okay, GitHub is showing us how, the way how it goes. So here you go. Um, challenge number five is zero energy. Can we do it? Okay, can we do it? I'm here in, in Stanford today, so... I presume loads of people from Stanford are here. Um, you know, prove MIT that you're better than them, okay? We just pumped a lot of money into MIT, a very smart way, doing it mainly from the material science point of view. It's a very different focus, okay? Coming up with materials which really allow us to, uh, to get, uh, you know, that, uh, get very close to zero energy. Now we need protocols to work. We need to know what are the fundamental limits. We need to know how to make it really work, et cetera, et cetera. So a very big ticket, but there is enough ambient energy out there, enough ambient energy uh, to power devices for quite a long time. Uh, it's all question of energy density, as we know. Um, but nobody has really thought of saying, you know, how would a telecom system look like in 2030, a system which does not consume any energy? And maybe we don't get there by 2030. Maybe it will take us to 2040. But if we start asking these really difficult questions today, I think we can come up with some really good solutions. So therefore, think about it, not minimize energy, get rid of energy expenditure altogether, all right? It's a very different optimization constraint, very different, okay? And last one is uh, uh, privacy, okay? And privacy is a really interesting topic uh, because as engineers, we've always said, not our problem, okay? Privacy is not our problem. Uh, security might be our problem, but privacy is not. It's a problem of the companies running the applications, and we always uh, tick off the T's and C's, the terms and conditions. Uh, we always agree with that, and we hope that the companies would be nice and decent and treating our data well, and uh, then it turns out that sometimes they didn't. Most of the time they did, but sometimes they didn't. So therefore, you know, getting privacy baked into the, um, um, into the infrastructure I think it's a really interesting challenge. Think about it, right? So uh, a router and a switch would never think of transmitting a packet which has not been encrypted. Could we do something similar from a privacy point of view? Could we design systems which go as far, right? We actually have a scholar from Harvard Stanford here. Diane is here. Thanks for coming. Who is an expert on privacy? In fact, on ethics altogether. And I learned from her that ethics is the, the uber cloud of privacy, uh, um, transparency, and what else was it? I can't remember. You told me more things. I forgot. And fairness. Here you go. Right? So it's a large ticket. But uh, I'm giving you the challenge, guys, to say, all right, this. right, let's see how much can we do as an engineering community and bring this into our OZ stack rather than leaving it uh, up to the mercy of the uh, companies on top.
right? It becomes a real challenge in the very mess of Exxon violence. It becomes worse and worse. Therefore, we need to do something about it. I'll leave that for you as a challenge. So that's my sixth challenge, and uh, we can stop here if you want to. If not, I can give you a bit of a rattle on the metaverse. Uh, but I'm happy to stop right now. We take discussions. It's really up to you, okay? Hey, I put, I put a question mark here, okay? Exciting. Question mark? Okay, all right. No, the, the interesting thing is it has nothing to do with him, actually. It has nothing to do with him, and not the guy in the red jacket, the other guy. It's Neil Stevenson. Uh, I met him here, actually, in Stanford. He was at the uh, uh, high event here the other day. And, uh, you know, we, anyway, uh, long story. I can stop him, and uh, we just discuss the... You want me to continue? We're good? Yeah? Yeah? All right. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's, let's talk about the one thing, right? This immersive all of art in Compass, uh, which everybody's hyped about. Of course, we know it's hype. But we also know that, you know, hype usually leads to something which... Um, you know, which eventually probably will stabilize into something, whatever we call it. So um, is Metaverse new? Well, not really. I just said Neil Stevenson coined the term in his 1992 uh, uh, novel, Snow Crash. And he did loads of predictions, actually, which were pretty spot on. A lot of stuff he didn't get right. But amazingly, he got a lot of stuff right. It's really amazing. So it, uh, it's really not new. And a lot of stuff has emerged ever since, right? So whether that is... Uh, Minecraft. In fact, I met the CEO of Minecraft today. Okay, so they are, um, you know, sh sh she was advocating that really this, these worlds are around. Uh, Roblox, they, they, have, they have both Minecraft, Minecraft and Roblox. Uh, Fortnite from Epic, uh, or I met the CEO of Second Life today, right? So then we have more advanced things like Decentraland, which are based on Web3 Zero constructs of uh, blockchain. A very interesting, Ifland. I don't think you've heard of Ifland, but Ifland has been created by a Korean operator. An operator. This is not like a Silicon Valley company. It's a telco operator which has created that, right? So these are, what, what are they really? I mean, you know, you can argue one way or another, but um, there's one thing we see is this is more than just a virtual construct, okay? This is more than just, you know, a virtual reality, nice graphics type of thing. This is a social construct, okay? This is where people spend time together just as we spend time together, just a little bit better. Okay, this is how we see that. And having been to AWE last week, you know, these Mobile World Congress of Immersive Technologies, I really have to say that I feel this is like 1998 all over again. 1998, we transited from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. We had a huge bubble. It burst, and then it consolidated, and we are where we are today, right? That transition is happening now to Web 3.0 uh, and the 3D web. Okay, Web 3.0 may come later. Web 3.0 is like a crypto web, but the 3D web is coming. It's really coming. And I feel it's the same thing. Heed my words, 2022 is the year 1998. So we're going to have a massive crash in 2025, 26, and then we will consolidate. And by the year 2030, we will have the next Googles, the next Facebooks coming out, right? So I think it's a huge opportunity for anybody working in, in, in here. So which is why I think we should pay attention. The other reason I think we should pay attention is because... A lot of that will now be based on an entirely new stack, okay? The distributed stack. I'll come to this in a moment. Uh, so anything we see here is very traditional. We know this, right? So you've got devices. You put them together connected. You build platforms on top. And then you can build applications on top, okay? Fortnite, et cetera. These are Fortnite is owned by Epic. So if Epic, uh, Epic wants to switch off Fortnite, they just switch off the service, and that's it. End of the story. And the other thing is Epic charges on top, right? So anybody wanting to use Fortnite, wants to buy things, have to pay posteriorly for, for the assets. Now, the distributed Web3.0 is coming and is building a completely new stack here composed of what I call the operating system, okay? There's a new type of operating system coming out which happens to be distributed, and running on loads of ledgers, happens to consume a lot of energy, being really not sustainable at all, but it's here, okay? It's coming. And only then do we build the, uh, right on top, we build the value chain, the tokens, the coins, the exchanges, the NFTs. They're not sitting on top of our application. They're sitting between the operating system and the application, all right? I think this is so smart. I mean, watch. Right? So we have a traditional ecosystem. We are, we're building a lot of stuff, we're building infrastructure. We are writing a web application, and then we're trying to charge for that. Nobody pays, and we go bankrupt. 
These guys, you know, do the infrastructure, put the money in there, then they put the application on top. And by virtue of if that application flies, finances will fly too, right? So they've inverted the stack. I think this is pretty smart, very smart. And I think we can learn from that quite a lot, right? So I think this is a very sexy construct really here. Um, and we'll see more of that. And efficiency will improve. So Ethereum is now, Ethereum now is actually transiting to proof of uh, uh, stake from proof of work. Uh, so it will be 99.99% more energy efficient. A lot of innovation happened. A lot of innovation. But actually, my fundamental question is now being in the uh, information uh, theory society is, you know, what, what is really the fundamental limit of, you know, having a distributed construct like the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the blockchain and have it, you know, minimum energy, uh, uh, maximum, uh, minimum expenditure and all that. What are the trade-offs? There must be kind of a Pareto curve, which nobody looked at because that construct wasn't invented by engineers. It was invented by computers, computer guys. And, you know, computer scientists build stuff. They just build it, throw it out, that's it. We've seen it with IP, right? It's everything but uh, anything but optimum, and yet it works, all right? Now, from our point of view, you know, what's, what is the Pareto here? Can we, can we work on this a little bit? Try to figure out what are the, what are the limits? Can we, if we believe in this future, uh, if we believe in this Web3.0 distributed blockchain type of thing, can we design something which is actually, uh, you know, theoretically optimum? Right? Can we do this? Uh, I'll leave that to you, my friends in Stanford. Anyway, so let's move on just to devices. Devices are undergoing a huge, uh, huge transition. Um, a lot of this will still be consumed on our mobile phones. Uh, they will be here for a very long time. And in fact, I have a theory that, you know, we get, you know, we have fingers, okay? And fingers, in my opinion, are like these mechanical parallel computing elements, right? So the mechanical executors, and we like to touch things, and keyboards and touching things will be there for a long time. So therefore, a purely immersive environment with, you know, where you have to grab things, um, not sure it will ever work. I mean, uh, has, has anybody of you tried VR? You know, I have many times. And uh, every time again, you're trying to grab something, it doesn't understand. So you're, you're spending like a lot of time. Imagine working in this environment. It's impossible, right? But anyway, so we will have devices uh, for a long time. Really interesting company just next door to you guys uh, within literally uh, probably uh, maybe 180 seconds drive. It's called Lea. Spin out of HP, led by a French guy called David. Very smart guys. Um, they built this 3D light field which gives you this full immersive depth on a 2D screen, okay? Uh, very, very impressive. And they have been trying to sell this for a long time. They're struggling, but uh, Sony threw out this similar tech, which is great because now Sony can really change the market, right? So I think it will come, maybe iPhone, whatever, 18. We will have the ability to see a spatial depth, which is incredible. You really feel it's 3D on a 2D screen. So really cool. Uh, of course, VR. All the graphics coming, AR coming, haptics, hmm, we'll see. These guys, I've seen them the other day. Uh, Mojo Vision, it's a it's Silicon Valley company, I think, I'm not sure. I've seen that at AWE. So, Connor Glenn is really out of Black Mirror. I'm not sure you watched by Netflix Black Mirror, but <laughs> right? contact lenses, and uh, it's impressive, really impressive. So, it's coming. Anyway. Um, to make this work, you know, meaningfully, we need to offload a lot of stuff. So I'm personally, I personally don't believe in VR too much as a big construct, but I believe in AR. So augmented reality, I think something really interesting. For AR to work, you know, a lot of tasks needs to be done. We need to read sensor data. We need to localize. We need to build point clouds. We need to then start to do the spatial mapping, optimize that, start detecting an object. And if the object moves, we need to track the object. So a lot of stuff going on. And that is only if you put on your glasses to make sure that whatever happens is spatially consistent, okay? So if I move my glasses, I want to make sure that, you know, the, if I have an overlay on this chair here uh, or any of your chairs, let's say me gi giving you names, right? So I know exactly who's in the audience. As I move, I want this always to be spatially persistent. So therefore, we need to do all that. It's a huge compute task. It takes a lot of battery and space. So, hey. Let's use our amazing networks and offload a lot of stuff. So we are you know, looking at edge clouds, which can do all these tasks in an edge cloud. So with NVIDIA, we've done a really interesting thing with Warner Bros, AT&T, NVIDIA, Qualcomm ourselves, and showing really the power of the offload scenario. And uh, we used NVIDIA as edge cloud to do a lot of that compute. 
it managed to prove that actually the energy uh, expenditure went down by a factor of seven. Factor of seven. Factor of seven is almost factor of 10. Factor of 10 is an order of magnitude. The order of magnitude is a game changer. Okay. So therefore, we will see more and more of the edge cloud stuff coming out. In terms of requirements, it's pretty steep. There's an interesting paper where the GSMA, if you look at it, you know, depending on where we go in terms of uh, spatial resolution, um, a lot of stuff we can do with 5G. A lot of the stuff we really need 6G to really make that happen, right? So it depends on the codex. The codex need to work well, feel of you and all that. So I don't want to bore you with that. Okay, I think I'm going to call it a day. Uh, if you want, check out our blog. So we wrote a blog here um, on the metaverse. All right. So just read it. I think it's quite interesting. Well, because I wrote it anyway. So the um, there's a lot of I think good material, kind of trying to critique as well. You know, what are the challenges we have? We have a lot of challenges around. Ethics, we have a lot of challenges around privacy, we have challenges around standards. Last thing we want is, uh, you know, a, a metaverse ecosystem or an immersive XR uh, ecosystem, which is interoperable, right? So I'll leave you with that. And I uh, thank you for staying uh, awake until that late hour. I'm happy to take any questions if you want to, and we take it from there. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, what she's asking is, besides solving problems in the virtual world like metaverse, what might be the problem that 60 is targeting, targeting to solve real world for humans? Again, what? What, what are the real world problems uh, you know, outside the, the this virtual metaverse yeah. kind of problem settings? Uh, what are the other real world problems that 60 is I think targeting? one of the, it's a good question. I mean, one of the biggest problems I think we still have is that, that problem of that unlimited connectivity. Okay, to really make sure we've been trying to get this right, and yet we have so often, you know, problems with connectivity. You want to get your banking transaction going, you click on whatever transfer, and the network breaks, and you don't know did you pay, did you not pay? Um, so just getting that right is really challenging, which is why we put it out as one of the tech challenges that truly unlimited connectivity. And I think it has to be a mix between, you know, real physics. Right, so densification, of course, you need a, you can't cheat Maxwell already, so a lot of densification going on. Uh, good fiber infrastructure to really make sure we get the, uh, the front hauling going. Um, and then, but also quite a lot of intelligence, right? So I think the caching intelligence, we haven't really explored that. And the reason is I have a theory around this. Now, I might be wrong, it's my personal theory, is that it is really down to the regulatory documents. Because when an auction is being won by an operator, they promise to uh, put a 98 or 99 percent coverage in the country. And uh, this is a physical coverage. OK, uh, what actually should be in the text is the perceived coverage. And that would change the thinking of the operators because they would say, hey, I don't need to provide real coverage uh, in terms of Maxwell Maxwellian RF coverage. I can get away with lots of not spots where there is no connectivity, but I need to invest a little bit more into the AI and the ability to cache, to predict, to traffic flow se segment and all that. All things we can do actually from a vendor point of view, you know, a lot of things we understand from a uh, academic point of view, we lack a bit of the overall system bounds. But if we start thinking more like a system rather than individual features, you know, then I think we could succeed. A good question, Anna. Thank you. How about connectivities for the rural communities? Yeah, uh, it goes in that space as well. And rural is an extra big problem in general. We haven't solved the rural problem the last 30 years, really. Okay, so and if you look at it, you know, the the the, the business case is present, you know, I, I can't really speak for the operators, but if you do the maths, you know, the, the business case isn't there. So the business case is really in the in the urban environments, um, and probably a bit of suburbia, really getting out in the rural areas is just not there. So I've always argued or when I was on the board of Ofcom as well as to uh, to look at it differently. 
Okay, l look at it differently. So, because it's a real long tail problem. It's a real long tail problem in the sense, you know, it's it's something which from a business point of view, for the few operators like Verizon, are like doesn't really make sense economically speaking. So they lose money there and they paid a lot of auction money to get going. But we know of business models which work really well in the long tail. And this is, for instance, Amazon. Okay. So if you look at Jeff Bezos, Amazon just in the United States or just in the UK uh, or just in Argentina or Colombia, you know, is not revenue positive, full stop. Same thing. Putting Amazon together as a global construct, suddenly it is actually revenue positive. And he has proven that. Business has shown that. Right. So therefore, you know, I had suggested to start looking at rural area as a more regional thing um, and possibly global thing. And of course, we then have, you know, constructs like um, uh, Elon Musk coming in, who is able to do the, let's say, the last percentage uh, using satellites. Turns out we have done the maths, you know, using fixed wireless access is a great solution for rural broadband. Um, legislators, though, for some reason, got very, very much married to fiber, you know, to have really fiber to the to the home, uh, which is a bit of a bummer, I have to say, because fiber is needed anyway. But if you could have fiber to the tower and then have the last mile wireless, it's a win, win and win situation. So we'll see there was a sixty five billion dollars beats program which just come out. Uh, depending on what each state does, some states say it has to be fiber. Uh, states which are neutral, whether it's fiber or something else, while the states which will succeed, I think. You heed my words, but it's going to be really that tech neutrality, which is which is really so important. So, yeah. So, I think, yeah, it's, a, it's an unsolved challenge, but government support definitely is needed or a global view on the on the thing. Really think it as a long, uh, long tail problem. Yeah. Does it make sense? My answer makes sense? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, <coughs> 2G uh, is, is primarily going to be defined by what UTPT comes up with, right? Simply because of UTPT's legacy yeah. as a wireless standard, yeah. Yeah. it is, it is uh, going to incorporate up to wireless type things. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, to be to solve these other yeah. issues, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, one, one needs to combine elements of all sorts of yeah. technologies. Yeah. 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 So the uh, the convergence technologies may not find full expression yeah. in a, yeah. in a <clears throat> I completely agree with you. And in fact, you know, convergence is kind of the really um, kind of the panacea or panacea of, 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 of let's say the end state. Having said this, you know, actually interestingly, 3GBP is able to do this. You know, if today you're on Wi-Fi and you leave your home and you you hand over, you know, that works, but the other way it doesn't work. All right. So therefore, the, pro the real problem is that the fiber community and the Wi-Fi community don't have that same standards gravitas and cannot agree on uh, trusted interfaces to make these handovers possible. So the convergence is not the, the for convergence not to happen. It's not a 3 people problem. It's the other ecosystem problem. So if you guys get your act together and we kind of start to, to work together, then this will work. But I agree with you. Uh, convergence would be the ideal outcome. Yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, so I have Thank you, first of all. Great talk. Uh, awesome talk. So I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is uh, the overhyping of AI. I don't I think that there is a lot of bullshit around it. And Elon Musk, with I am a fan, I was in the same room at Stanford when he promoted SpaceX and I didn't take him seriously. So I definitely admire the guy, but he's part of the problem. So I am of the Roger Progress view that there are limits to what ML can do. And there was recently a controversy at Google actually of, there was some other thing, but claims about AI being able to route semiconductors better, publish nature, and the author who called the shots were fired. So there is a lot of bullshit there. So that was the first comment. Uh, not, not that you're doing, but in general in the community. I think that it's a good technology, machine learning. It has a lot of things, but this notion that it can be, do things better than humans, uh, sorry, I don't mind, is a statistical prediction and machine learning encodes the past. It cannot outsmart humans at things that humans haven't done yet in a supervised learning manner. That's my statement. I so think you made the same comment at high, right? Where? Where you have the, um, 
Yes, the I was at the AI yeah. conference. I think you and, made the same comment. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and I'm sorry. I mean, I admire Elon Musk greatly. As I said, I was, yeah. when he presented SpaceX in the Thurman building that is now, yeah. a lot of people laugh at him. I was one of them. And, but it's, Elon Musk, is great, is, his, his training is in physics. It's not in mathematics. Um, Godel, all these great minds of the past have studied the problem greatly. Uh, you know, <laughs> understanding, which is what humans do, and a statistical prediction, which is what machine learning does. I, you know, I, 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 I really admire Elon Musk simply yes, because I, I, I build a few companies myself, and I know that this is just incredible what he's doing. Yeah. Okay, now I don't think we should blame him for, you know, what is I think factual that a lot of that is completely overhyped. You know, so I agree with you. But, but are, you, are, you, are, you, are you thinking that that AGI, that uh, artificial yes, gener yes. general and, intelligence, and will never happen? I have Tesla mm. stock, so I, mm. I, I, bought, I invested a big chunk, so I'm, I'm not questioning. But AGI, I don't think is going to happen at all. I mean, period. With Turing computing. I mean, we'll have to move away from Turing computing and the halting problem and all the things that the halting problem implies and the Godel incompleteness theorems before we see AGI. Oh, I, 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 agree. I, I also think that the... Uh, the traditional architectures, phenomenon yes. architectures, and all, all the lo traditional logic will not work. Exactly. I agree. So, if yeah. you come with a, a, Turing, a computing paradigm that is not Turing computing, mm -hmm. which is something else, then I agree. So, that was the comment. The mm -hmm. question is designing privacy by what you said about how do you plan to do that? Because the regulatory environment is against that, actually. Mm -hmm. Governments are, Apple, for example, has been fighting for doing that and has gotten a lot of pushback from the US government, among others. So, that will be my question. But so I'll, I'll, if you allow me, I will answer that question in two years' time. Okay, call me, call me back. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I, I do have an answer, but uh, we'd like to explore this a little bit further. So yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You mentioned that uh, is. Um, 10 times the KPI over 5G. Um, do you have any intuition where those uh, improvements can be uh, achieved, given that uh, we're already very close to the channel limit? As, as, as another great question. So, you know, I think the spatial dimension will give us quite a lot. I mean, you know, MIMO was effectively invented here. Through, uh, through Paul Raj, right? So, and it's still living up to this. So if you think about it, you know, the trick is really to create as many spatial substreams as we can. And how could you do that? Well, you know, we go from massive MIMO to supermassive MIMO. Um, of course, we're gonna then very quickly see a hardened channels. I'm not sure how much you know about MIMO, you're know, the super duper expert on this, but you see a hardened channel essentially uh, your eigenvalue matrix is uh, largely zero, is, uh, sorry, ones on the, on the diagonal, right? So how do we go about this? Well, you know, we could think of uh, starting to work with the environment, which is why people start to look at the intelligent reflective surfaces. So I think this is a really great way of increasing diversity for the environment. How to do it exactly? I don't know. But I also think that this space needs to be regulated so we don't get in the same trap as we did with uh, some of the 4G and 3G stuff. So we need to start thinking around also regulation. What is allowed really to be done in the wall in this, right? So but basically increase the spatial dimensions. Um, you know, we we don't think, you know, the return, in fact, you mentioned Emil. So Emil's a good friend of mine. You know, if you look at his, some of his talks, he, he has proven it's very simple out of... Uh, uh, um, the uh, not the shine, the shine equations that asymptotically speaking as you go wider bandwidths your returns go down it's basically a log of relationship simply by the uh, extra noise you're capturing right so and therefore you know i think as an industry we kind of realized okay going wider bandwidths going higher carrier frequency is a bit of a bummer let's try to see if we can stay in the mid bands which is where all the rf is where the value is we stay there uh, we have these bands. Let's try to get as much as we can, but let's say it's limited. Let's work down the spatial dimensions. So su super minor, I think, would be very interesting. Therefore, small antenna arrays, large antennas, actually, which also requires a change in regulation, by the way. So there's a lot of things we, we could do today to increase these spatial, um, the spatial channels. And then to, to manage this is a nightmare.
So in 5G, for instance, millimeter wave in frequency range two, uh, the sync channels, right? There's a lot of primary and secondary sync channels uh, always trying to capture who's around. Uh, because it's a pen pencil beam, for them to capture who's around and get this going is a real is really difficult. Took, took three to be in the industry a long, long time to sort this out. Now imagine you're going to super mimo. Uh, how do we do this then, right? So and this is where AI I think can help a lot to do uh, kind of predictive kind of scanning of the sync channels and all that. Um, so I think it's going to be a mix between you know AI ML. I know you don't believe in this, but it's very very very. Uh, a specific task ML and the 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 spatial the spatial dimension increase. Right, does it make sense to you? Totally. Yeah, I say right. Yeah. 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 But even though it's not easy. It's not easy. I'm telling you, I'm not. I'm not sure how we're going to do it, and I'm not sure why. But it will happen. It will happen. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. No, there's going to be more stuff, right? So we look at, I mean, stuff like angular orbital modulation stuff, uh, which has, you know, I remember in, in CTTC, we, we built a prototype in 2010. So it's an old thing, but takes time to actually get it into the, uh, I'm not sure how uh, OM will really work with Super MIMO. So talk, people talk about cell-free COM, uh, uh, cell-free distributed MIMO. Uh, once we manage to synchronize the base stations down to, uh, really pick a, pick a seconds. We can do other really interesting things. So, you know, it's, I think it's going to be small ingredients here and there who get us to this 10x. And the other thing is uh, from 4G to 5G, right? The one coming with called 5G right now. Yeah. The original 5G, right? It's the lower band, supposedly the original 5G is uh, more high band. Yeah. The frequency range too, yeah, 26 and 28 gig, yeah. yeah. So I, I think the, the motivation of people to, we're not changing for the sake of changing this generation. Mm -hmm. There has to be something real there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we also learned that, you know, my trend number two is, you know, we always do these predictions. Uh, we try to build the killer apps and then there's always something else coming along, all right? So we started, Hans Vesberg, the current CEO of uh, Verizon and the, our former chief executive said, you know, we started designing 3G when the internet wasn't around. We started designing 4G when the iPhone wasn't around. So people like you and me were sitting around 2000 thinking what could be 4G like? And they came up with, uh, you know, these mobile web kind of applications. Maybe you've been part of that design process, right? We got totally wrong. And then the iPhone came along, along and suddenly 4G made sense. 4G era, we're trying to predict how 5G will look like. And now these XR devices will come. The next 12 months will be very interesting. And suddenly 5G will make sense. So I'm not too worried about this at all. You know, following the trend, let's build it. And the next, the 6G iPhone will come along, whatever that will be. Yeah. Uh, we'll have two more questions. Um, sorry. Uh, there are two more questions. One question is regarding the privacy in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's built on a Web 2.0 construct, so let's say a Fortnite, then it's owned, it's owned by you, uh, but controlled eventually by the, by the owner, by the platform, right? They can switch it on and off. Uh, if it's a Metaverse a Web 3.0 construct, like Decentraland or if um, you essentially, it, you, it's owned by you, and it's controlled by a distributed infrastructure, which is controlled by everybody who's part of that, okay? So there's no central owner. Nobody can just switch it off. Just a majority quora of people could switch it off, okay? So therefore, uh, it is attractive from this point of view. How to regulate this? We don't know. Is they, we don't know how to regulate this. We don't even know even how to enforce things 
in a distributed web free zero setting? I think it's a very good question. We don't know. The answer is simply we don't know. Mm. This is uh, related to uh, the, the zero energy devices you yeah. mentioned. So, you know, the question is asking is, are you talking about zero, zero energy devices or zero, zero energy systems? The example is, if you consider semantic communication, a lot of compute goes on in making, you know, you know a lot of AI makes it happen, creating the context, learning the context, and then compressing in some sense, and the bitstream is only transmitting the compressed information or changes, right? So it is, even though the, the energy required to transmit or the communication link uh, you know, significantly yeah. Yeah. bit width required as well as yeah. the energy required yeah. comes down. Overall computation to make it realize the semantic communication. Yeah. communication for it. Yeah. Now, how do you realize this? Are you talking about zero energy systems or are you talking about zero energy devices? Or yeah. So we, okay. So primarily to start with, we want a zero energy, um, you know, components. Okay, that's the first thing we need to do. And that's what we're trying to tackle right now. Then I think zero energy devices would be fantastic. So we're really good to have, you know, at least the wireless side, the untethered side to really run on zero jowl. Will we ever be able to get a zero energy system? I'm not sure, but at least on the main net, we can have a lot of um, uh, renewable sources attached to that, right? So whether you run solar or tidal, whatever, I think it would be interesting to get this very theoretical trade-off on what should be in a, in a renewable cloud versus a zero energy device, right? Because I think that will be, again, kind of a Pareto curve, probably a three or five dimensional one. But I think it's an open challenge. I don't know. But we'd love to have, you know, definitely zero energy devices and a minimum energy expenditure running on renewable. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you so much, Misha. All right. Thanks. Good questions. <laughs>